Great pleasure to introduce to you today Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple Computer, who is going to uh, give you a talk on the art of innovation. Something works. Um, uh, yeah, it's great to be here. Technology, you know, kind of flows, and it flows like uh, it's a matter of the mind. And so great to be here. I've seen so many great exhibits already that have excited me quite a bit. Go to some places in the world, you know, like Singapore. And everybody in Singapore is trained to be an MBA, and they're trained in the business ways, and they they're all going to be rich and successful. And and um, everything is so clean and everything's so orderly and there's a lot of rules. And then I think, where are the great writers from Singapore? Where are the great um, artists and where are the great um, you know, singers and, and uh, athletes? So it's kind of like uh, we need more, more of the, the freedom to think creatively in our culture. And technology, you know, almost always when we create new things, and we're always trying to think of how, what's a new way of doing something, it's a little bit like humor itself. Humor, you will tell a story and somebody is listening very logically, and then you have a punchline and somebody says, oh, there was a different path, ha ha. And it's kind of, kind of humorous, it's one of the joys in life. And joys in life are one of the things that are built into us that make us go in certain directions. And innovating in electronics is really thinking of a different approach to things, but not just like an artist who just wants to think different, think different, think different, we actually have to build devices that do something useful for people as well. Innovation starts when we're very young and it starts with inspiration. Who am I? What am I in this world? Where am I going? When we are born, we have a natural curiosity to open up every object, to touch anything we can. Even before we can move our own limbs, it's nice if a parent pushes us into a nice soft drape. And it's just like we want to learn. This is how the world's constructed. But we also want to explore. And then somewhere in our life, we kind of make a transition and we want to start creating a few of our own things, whether it be a little bit of art with a crayon on paper, whatever. Um, when I was young, you know, we have, we have heroes. And heroes often set your direction in life. Why do I want to be in technology? Why do I want to be an artist? Why do I want to build buildings? Whatever it is, it often comes from heroes. Heroes that we see in movies, that we see on television, heroes that we read about in books. And a lot of them, they had series of books when I grew up. They had a series for the boys called The Hardy Boys. They had a series for the girls called Nancy Drew. And my, me and my friends, we bought these ones called Tom Swift Jr. He was an engineer. He owned his own company with his father. And when there was a crisis on Earth, he would go into the laboratory and hook weird equipment together and build things and he would come out with a contraption whether it was a spaceship to win a space race or a submarine to catch some underwater spies or a plasma field to entrap alien life forms he would go in and build it himself he was resourceful he used his knowledge and his abilities to do that and i knew that i wanted to be that kind of a person that was a scientist that came up with solutions to things um, I was very lucky that my father was an engineer, that I grew up in Silicon Valley and had a lot of good inspirations. My friends were all interested in electronics. Almost all the kids on my street were interested in electronics. And back in those days, looking at a big resistor and looking at the color codes where red meant two and orange meant three, the fact that we learned these things made us special. It made us feel that we, were, we had some special importance in the world. We knew something the other kids could care less about in school. And um, as electronic kids, we'd go around and work on projects. Usually, since we had no money, we would just stare at pictures and read magazines, popular electronics magazine, projects you could build, projects other people were building, little things that made interesting sounds or sirens. And uh, one time, we got some telephone wire and we strung it along the fence. We walked along the fence and we strung it all the way up the block and we could push buttons and ring buzzers and flashlights to wake our friends up at night and then climb out our windows and go meet somewhere. And we had this house to house intercom where we could talk to each other. We built it ourselves. Well, somewhere on one of the houses of the wire, the owner of the house had cut the wire into about 100 pieces. 
So we didn't know, you know, we just thought you could just run a wire on a fence. We didn't know people were going to object. So we ran the wire on the other side of the fence so that person couldn't cut it. And that was my first delving into marketing. <laughs> I also grew up, you know, the inspiration for technology was the environment. You know, growing up in Silicon Valley, as it really was a valley, full of orchards of fruit trees, as far as you could see. You know, almost no buildings, almost no homes, and to, uh, to get to live there. But we were changing the world from vacuum tubes, and I still love to wear a vacuum tube watch. Um, my first ham radio, when I was in 10 years old, got a ham radio license. I read in a book that you could actually contact people far away with radio, and you could get a ham radio license at any age. You can't drive a car at any age. You have to be, say, 16 years old to drive a car. But you could get a ham radio license at 10 years old. Wow, that was another way to be special. So I got a ham radio license, and my parents bought me kits. Ham radios in those days were kits of parts. Big, you had to bolt together big pieces of metal and face plates and put on dials and run cords and solder all the tubes in and solder all the parts together and, and bolt everything. It was a large project to build a ham radio and uh, it was good training for an engineer later in life because the worthwhile projects for any engineer are the ones that take a long time and a lot of effort and a lot of diligence where you stick with it and you don't give up. Um, but I grew up in this environment of Silicon Valley where vacuum tubes were being replaced by transistors. One of the inventors of the transistors had moved across our country and relocated in your Silicon Valley and started a company. Out of his company, which was trying to build a part that was too hard to build, sprung a lot of companies like Fairchild and Raytheon and, and, Raytheon and Ream and they, they built transistors that worked. And they discovered there was a market, especially with the military. And then my father took me to a show in San Francisco one day, one year. And a guy showed me a picture in a booth. And he pointed to the picture, and it looked like a map of a city with a few buildings showing. And he said, this is a map of the, of the first chip we're going to make. Six transistors on one piece of silicon. With the same steps to make one transistor, we're going to make six transistors. Wow, I was just so amazed. But I look back and think, I must have been talking to Gordon Moore, one of these people that started the first chip companies ever. Now, back in those days, no one could afford a chip, no normal individual. Only the military could afford chips because they had to save every last gram in the <coughs> missiles to get a missile to launch. It was worth so much money. So the military, my father worked at Lockheed Missiles and Space Company in Sunnyvale. He had close connections to these chip companies and they were, um, and it was just nice to see how this development was going in electronics. Um, innovation is also enhanced in your life by your own intellect. In other words, as Einstein said, the, the, um, the lucky, you know, chance favors the prepared mind. Okay, I discovered a computer journal in my hallway one day. I was already, you know, top student in math and science, and I discovered a journal that talked about computers. Computers were unheard of back then. It was like, you know, they talk about rocket science as far out. Computer science was further than rocket science. You never expected to see this thing called a computer in your life. You saw pictures of computers.